today we're very happy to welcome Jens Eberhardt from the Max Planck Institute to speak on our seminar. And you'll be telling us about K motives and causal duality and geometric representation theory. Yes, thank you so much, first of all, for the invitation. I'm extremely excited to speak here. And um, so my talk has the goal to give a kind of, let's say, new perspective on Kujul duality using K-theory. And um, so I first learned about uh, Kujul duality when I did my PhD in Freiburg with Wolfgang Sörgel. And I remember that when I first uh, learned about it, I was kind of stunned. Because, I mean, on the one hand, it's very beautiful, but on the other hand, also very complicated, I would say, and uh, mysterious, yeah? So uh, I always had the question, how can someone come up with this thing? And uh, so in the beginning of my talk, I want to do some examples and try to put ourselves in the shoes. Uh, let's see, I want the next slide of someone who, uh, lives in the 1980s and uh, kind of gets the first impression of or hints of Kujul duality and then develop the story from there. And then uh, I want to kind of talk about the status quo. So what kind of uh, Kujul, what uh, big statements you have about Kujul duality in geometric representation theory and then develop this new K-theoretic perspective. Okay, so let's start with the most basic uh, example, which has nothing to do with geometric representation theory, but which is like the smallest toy example. So let's say you have two algebras, A, which is Kx modulo x squared, and A shriek, which is Kx. So those are non different algebras. yeah. And then you play around with them and kind of study the properties of certain modules of those algebras. So for example, you can do something uh, like this. You can compute the endomorphisms of the regular module for A, yeah? Okay, that's very simple calculation. You get Kx modulo x squared. Okay, you know how this object behaves. On the other hand, you could compute the x algebra of the simple module of A shriek. Yeah? You take projective resolution and compute this x algebra. And then you see, aha, this is also Kx modulo x squared. And then you say, oh, wow, so somehow those different objects in different categories behave in the same way. So at this point, you could say, whatever, it's just a coincidence. Or you could try and push on and kind of ask, is there some deeper reason, maybe an equivalence of categories behind this uh, coincidence? Um, so, uh, you look at the category of A modules and A shriek modules and kind of want to find something that induces this uh, fact that both of those algebras are the same. Um, so then you immediately have two problems. First problem is the algebra on the left, this A, this Kx modulo x squared, it's not graded, it's just this thing, whereas the algebra on the right-hand side is graded. Second problem you have on the right hand side, your algebra is uh, this X algebra. It's not really a homomorphism space in your category of A modules, whereas the left hand side is. So to kind of uh, get uh, the two things on the same level, you say, okay, but really I could look at graded A modules on the left hand side and then this algebra on the left will be graded because this algebra is a natural grading. Yeah? And on the right hand side, I can pass to the derived category because inside of there, the X algebra really is a, a, a homomorphism space. Okay, and then actually this coincidence can be written as an equivalence of categories, namely between the additive category generated by the object A and all of its grading shifts on the left-hand side and the ca additive category generated by this object K and all of its cohomological shifts on the right-hand side. Yeah? So that would be an equivalence of categories, but kind of, it's uh, more or less a general nonsense equivalence of categories, yeah? And then you could ask yourself, can I make this into kind of a derived equivalence between uh, two categories of modules? And in fact, this is possible. And it works something like this. You kind of pass to the graded and derived, uh, uh, dry, pass to the graded and derived uh, category on both sides. And actually you can write down a derived equivalence between those categories, exchanging the object A on the left-hand side with the object K on the right-hand side. And you have this weird 
thing that the shift of grading on the left hand sides correspond to shift of grading plus cohomological shift on the right hand side, which kind of reflects the fact that we had this X algebra on the left, whereas we had just the endomorphism algebra on the uh, X algebra on the right, where we just set the endomorphism algebra on the left. And now um, you can ask yourself, okay, why was this possible? And you kind of get a lot, uh, you can get a big theory in algebra and homological algebra. You say, okay, you could define uh, certain properties of uh, algebras which make this whole thing possible. Let's say those algebras are Kojul. And then you call this equivalence here Kojul duality. And you can basically, uh, uh, you can basically generalize this to infinity. But uh, this is not what we are going to do in this talk, but rather we want to look at specific situations in geometric representation theory where such a Kojul duality holds or something even just similar to what is going on here, which doesn't formally count as a result like this. Okay, great. So now uh, let's do a geometric representation theory example. So what category do we take? We can take uh, category O for SL2C. Yeah? So we take the principal block of this category, which is just uh, generated by two Verma modules of highest rate zero and minus two. And minus two I've written here as S dot zero, yeah, okay. But um, so you could study this uh, category. So for example, you have two indecomposable projectives, which are the projective covers of those Verma modules. And I've written down their composition series here, okay. Um, okay, so now uh, you can also study the properties of those objects. For example, you could compute the endomorphism ring of this projective here uh, for, for S. And um, you can easily see already from the composition series that this endomorphism ring will be the CX modulo X squared. Great. Let's continue and compute even more. Let's compute the algebra of category O. So the algebra of category is the algebra, the endomorphism uh, uh, ring of a pr projective generator, which is, would just be this direct sum here, for example. And then uh, you see that this algebra has an extremely nice explicit description as a quiver algebra with this one uh, relation. Okay. Um, and I think, I mean, this kind of description was already known a long time, even a long time before the 1980s, because people were studying the Lorentz group for a very long time already. And the uh, Lie algebra of the Lorentz group is SA2C, yeah? So um, they knew this for a very long time in some form, okay. Or similar kind of represent uh, representation categories and uh, uh, this combinatorial descriptions there. Okay, great. So now, what should be on the Kojul dual side, yeah, on the right hand side of this uh, of, 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 of this line? So uh, here we take uh, constructible sheaves on P1. So P1, the complex projective line, has a stratification to a line and the point, and we take sheaves which are kind of uh, constant along those uh, things. Uh, okay. So there are two important kind of objects I want to uh, study here. I want to look at the, 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 the skyscraper sheaf on a point and the constant sheaf on P1. And I want to study how they behave. Okay, so uh, the constant sheaf on P1, the X algebra of this is the cohomology ring of P1. So CX modulo X squared, yeah? The same thing that I get on the left-hand side. And also you can compute the X algebra of the sum of those two objects. And you see, actually you will get the same exact uh, quiver as on the, on the, on the left-hand side when you try to compute this X algebra. Okay. Uh, and now, I mean, of course, this is uh, kind of could be a crazy coincidence or it could be just a symptom of a very uh, big thing, which indeed it is. So, um, as on the first slide, we can try and make this into an equivalence of categories. So we can have the, on the left-hand side category O, on the right-hand side the sheaves, and we can pass to a graded category O because this algebra of category O is naturally graded. We, for example, we could say those arrows should have degree one yeah, in this uh, quiver. And then we can pass to a graded category O by simply looking at graded modules over this graded algebra. 
So, and inside of those two categories we have now, we can look at the projectives on the left-hand side and those IC objects on the right-hand side and the additive category generated by them and all of the shifts of grading on the left-hand side and shifts in cohomological degree on the right-hand side. And this combinatorial description above tells us that those two additive categories are equivalent to each other. Okay, so at this point you would say, okay, very mysterious that those two additive categories, which seemingly are unrelated, uh, actually the same, yeah? Okay, so, and you could ask now, I guess, millions of questions, what you should do now. First question is, this should generalize. I mean, if this would just be true for SA2, it would maybe be boring, yeah? But is this true for arbitrary reductive groups and what else can you do with this? The next question that always came to me, and actually I don't know any answer to this question is, I have this graded category O now, does it actually have some meaning in terms of representation theory of the Lie algebra? Yeah? Actually, I don't know if this is true and I asked many people and I didn't get any positive and nice answer to this. Um, also, on the first slide, remember, we equip both sides with a grading, also the right-hand side. So you could ask yourself, is there kind of a grading on this category of sheaves? And this actually has some beautiful answer, affirmative answer, which I will get into soon, which says that there is actually a very geometric way of making the right-hand side graded, which will actually help me to write down a Cajun duality statement like on the first slide. Okay, and then another question, which is also not answered, uh, would be, is there some kind of natural way, uh, natural functor, which passes from the left to the right-hand side, which really takes a representation and does something to it, which you, and then uh, makes it into a, a, some kind of complex of sheaves, which is direct, which has some meaning really, yeah, which goes above that the combinatorial uh, description of the objects. And this question is also unanswered, yeah? I mean, there's the localization theorem which passes from category O to sheaves, but actually does something completely different yeah, than what this uh, functor here will do. So this can't be it, yeah? So is there something else, yeah? Which uh, some kind of Fourier transform, or I mean, uh, I mean, this is not known. Okay, so um, let me quickly go to the generalization of what we've seen on the first slide. So here we have three important papers. The first one is by Balinson and Ginsburg, which kind of comes up with the correct conjecture. How should this uh, generalize, yeah? Then there's a paper in German by Sergel, which actually proves this conjecture and introduce, introduces lots of, lots of new ideas into this uh, business. And then a joint paper in English, where they all three team up and put their stuff together, yeah? Okay, so what's actually uh, happening in this general picture? So we have some arbitrary complex reductive uh, Lie algebra instead of just SA2. Then um, we have uh, the principal block of category O and uh, indecomposable projectives are indexed by the Weyl group, yeah? So instead of having just two, we have as many as elements in the Weyl group. And, um, we can right away do an example computation, namely we could compute the endomorphism ring of one particular projective module, which is like the biggest of the projectives. And uh, it turns out that this has a very nice combinatorial description, which I've put here in terms of this algebra C, which is called the co-invariant algebra. Okay, so now let's pass to the right-hand side. There we take the Langlands dual flag right, uh, the Langlands dual uh, reductive algebraic group, and we take the flag variety associated to this, which is some smooth projective variety F has, which has an affine uh, stratification into uh, affine spaces, and they are, uh, which are called Bruja cells, and they are also as many of them as uh, elements in the Weyl group. So also here um, we can define some objects in certain sheaves. We can look at IC sheaves on the Schubert uh, varieties inside of this uh, flag variety. Great. So let's also do an example computation with them. Let's take a look at the um, IC sheaf on the whole flag variety, which is just a constant sheaf, and look at the X algebra of this, which happens to just be the uh, 
uh, cohomology of P1. And now Borel has this description of the cohomology of P1 also completely combinatorial and also in terms of this algebra C. Yeah? So this very, uh, very striking parallel between those two sides. And now um, what Zergel actually does is he doesn't only do this for this anti-dominant projective or this one particular sheaf, he does it for everything. So he has a this combinatorial description of the projectives on the left-hand side in terms of certain modules over this co-invariant algebra called Zergel modules and of the IC sheaves on the right-hand side in terms of basically the same modules, but now they have a grading as well. Yeah, so he gives a combinatorial description which matches, yeah, just a small detail that on the right hand side you have grading, whereas on the left hand side you don't. Okay, so this is like uh, generalizing what we had on the first slide a lot. And um, now what you can, you can play the same game, you can define a graded category O because you have a combinatorial description in terms of an algebra which admits a grading. And uh, you can construct a uh, equivalence of additive subcategories like this. Okay, so that's the first uh, big ingredient, I would say. And to really make this into Kujou duality, we also want a grading on the right hand side on the sheaves, uh, which I want to describe next. Yeah. And uh, okay, let's go to the next uh, slide. Ah, so on this slide, I want to explain of how you can grade, uh, find a graded version of this category of uh, constructible sheaves on your flag variety. So now, I mean, this shouldn't confuse too much. Now the word graded and mixed is kind of used uh, in a similar fashion. So actually what I would say, we want a mixed version of this category. So um, what does the word mixed mean? It, the, 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 the word, um, Mixed should mean the same as the mixed in mixed Hodge structures, yeah? So it should be the following idea. The flag variety, I mean, you can interpret just as a topological space and looks on sheaves on this, but actually it's more than that, yeah? It is a, a algebraic variety. So the cohomology of an algebraic variety has an upgrade to, to not just a graded vector space, but to, uh, to uh, you can put a Hodge structure on this. Or you can put a mixed touch structure on this if it's not smooth or not compact. Yeah, so it's this mixed and this word mixed. And in the same way as the cohomology of a complex algebraic variety can be upgraded, the categories of sheaves on such a variety can be upgraded to mixed Hodge modules or uh, to so-called mixed L added sheaves. Okay, and these are the categories that were used in this uh, original paper by Balins and Ginsburg and Sörge. But those categories have some small technical problems, let's say, yeah, which I won't get into. So I will use a third version of mixed upgrade of our category of sheaves, which is a category of mixed, uh, derived category of mixed uh, motives on this flag variety. So, I mean, the word motive means really a lot. To us, it will mean something very simple, which I will explain uh, in, in a second. And it will be this category that we will use to construct a mixed upgrade of, uh, of our category of sheaves that kind of reflects that our variety is, that our flag variety is a variety and not just any topological space. So um, um, the, the, this category of, uh, this uh, derived category of motives here on a point spec FP with rational, we do everything, do everything with rational coefficients now. Um, has a endofunctor. And this endofunctor is called a tetris. So that's the same kind of tetris you perhaps know from Hodge theory or Eladic homology. And uh, this is an endofunctor on our category, which we kind of would like to think of as a shift of grading functor. And in fact, it is kind of true that it is a shift of grading functor when you restrict yourself to a small uh, subcategory. Uh, namely, when you just look at the constant object and its uh, tate twists like this, and the triangulated category spanned by this is just the derived category of graded Q vector spaces. So really, shifting your constant object by n is like shifting the graded vector space in by degree. Okay. And now um, there's also a functor which forgets about all this motive stuff and just passes back to sheaves, which is called a realization functor. And this functor forgets about the tetris because there's no tetris just on the sheaf level. 
Okay, so that's the picture on just a point, but we want to do it on the whole flag variety and not just the point. So we just look at the uh, derived category of uh, motives on the flag variety. And we just look at the constructible objects inside. So the triangulated subcategory generated by all the constant sheaves on the Bruja cells and their tail twists. And this actually behaves like a graded version of, uh, uh, this behaves like a graded version of our category of um, uh, sheaves on the flag variety. Yeah? Because the Tatris behaves like the shift of grading and you have a functor that forgets about all this business. Okay, so now um, what is so cool about this mixed version and how can you use it? So uh, I want to list some of the properties. The first property is something that really helps for working with this, namely this category of mixed uh, sheaves has the six functor formalism. Yeah, So you can just work with them as you usually do and completely forget about the motives in the background. Yeah, And everything you do, which just involves the six functor will work in the same exact way in this uh, category. Yeah? But then it has some remarkable structure, which is not present in sheaves at all, yeah? which is called a weight structure. So um, uh, uh, just from the standpoint of uh, homological algebra, a weight structure is something similar to a T structure. Some people call it a co T structure. So it is something which has similar axioms to a T structure, just some arrows turned around or some sign is changed. So how I remember the difference between weight structure and T structures, you know you can glue T structures and you can also glue weight structures. You take exactly the same formulas, but you exchange the shrieks and the stars. Yeah, Then this is the gluing process for the weight structures. So um, this category of motives has a weight structure. And the idea behind the weight structure is really that it captures the weight of objects where weight is in the sense of weight, which you would have in Eladic homology or for mixed Hodge structures. So the idea is there should be objects which are pure of weight zero, and those should correspond to with smooth projective uh, varieties. And uh, all the rest is kind of mixed or built together from those pure objects. Yeah, This is kind of the philosophy behind it. So in particular, you could look at the weight zero uh, objects in this motivic category. And those would be all the motives which correspond to smooth projective varieties. So this was already defined, uh, motives of smooth projective varieties were already defined a long time before the right category of motives. It's this additive category of Chow uh, motives. So the heart of this Chow weight structure on the motives picks out all the things which come from smooth projective varieties. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's try and understand this heart of the weight structure in this setting. And now the decomposition theorem will tell us something beautiful, namely the weight zero objects in this category will just be direct sums of IC sheaves appropriately shifted. So there's also a notion of weight for Eladic sheaves. And maybe you know that in BBD, the decomposition theorem is also stated like this, that objects which are pure of weight zero would decompose into IC objects like this. And this is also true in uh, this uh, setting here. So, um, but I think that the weight zero objects here, actually it's better to not think about them as direct sums of IC sheaves, because if you do the same thing, maybe in characteristic P, it will no longer be true that you get the IC sheaves here, but you would get parity sheaves here instead, yeah? Or like the motivic version of parity sheaves here. Or I mean, yeah, but so here, when we have the rational coefficients and uh, like the decomposition theorem, then we will have this, uh, then we will have this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this nice description. And now this category of IC sheaves here, uh, or this weight zero category has a nice combinatorial description in terms of graded circle modules. Yeah, in the same way as we had it on the slide uh, before. Okay, so, now, another beautiful fact about weight structures is the following. Uh, weights, if you have a weight structure, you will also get a functor, namely the so-called weight complex functor. 
And what the weight convex functor will do, it will take an object in your category and slice it up into pieces which are kind of pure, of, uh, which are pure, and then put them into a complex in the homotopy category of the pure objects of weight zero. So this functor is kind of dual, not really dual, but it's kind of dual to the functor, the realization functor, which you would have for, uh, for the T-structure setting, where you would have a functor from the derived category of the heart of the T-structure into the derived category. Yeah? So this is the weight structure version of this uh, functor. And beautifully, this functor in this very particular setup turns out to be an equivalent, meaning your whole complicated category of motives or whatever on your space just turns out to be the same as the homotopy category of Zergel modules. So it has a very explicit description. Okay, let me see the time. Ah, give me one more minute before the break, okay? Yeah. Uh, so now we can write down Kujul duality as really an equivalence between two big derived categories. Namely, on the left-hand side, we have the derived graded category O. On the right-hand side, we have those mixed sheaves on the Langlands dual fact variety. Both categories admit a, a combinatorial description in terms of the homotopy category of graded circle modules. So I can build this equivalence like this. This equivalence maps the projectives on the left-hand side to the ICs on the right-hand side. And it still has this weird property of interchanging the grading shift on the left-hand side with the shift and cohomologic uh, shift, uh, grading shift plus cohomological shift on the right-hand side. So it still has this weird property like we've seen on the first slide. And uh, if you like, and you don't like category O at all, you can also just make this into a statement which is purely about the mixed chiefs. And we could make this into a equivalence between the categories of uh, mixed chiefs on X and mixed chiefs on its dual. Okay, and now let's go into the break with a question which is kind of strange, which is what about the following? Let's forget about all this grading business. So the grading on category O, was kind of strange. It has no representation theoretic meaning. The grading on the uh, sheaf side was very complicated. So what if I told you that you can do Kojul duality completely natural? I would, I mean, you can do Kojul duality uh, without gradings as well, which is the stuff that I want to explain to you uh, after the break. Okay. Okay, great. Let's take a five minute break. We'll meet back at 3.32. In the meantime, if there are any uh, questions, you can ask yes. Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm very happy yes. about this because I've always preferred co-T structures to T structures. So this is nice. But um, is, there a, um, is there a criterion for Bondarko's uh, realization theorem to be an equivalence, like, they're, like the corresponding thing in T structure land? Yes. So the, the thing is the heart of the T structure will never have any a uh, positive X group inside of the big category. And also for this to ever work, it shouldn't better have negative X group because in this homotopy category, it won't. So that's actually already it. it shouldn't have positive nor negative X groups. With those objects won't because they are pure of, I mean, because uh, they, they are also at the heart, they also live in the site, in the, 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 the heart of a T structure, some of them. So you can kind of, yeah, yes, compute this. Yes. And just a quick thing. I mean, the weight complex functor technically doesn't exist always. You need, in the same way as the realization functor, you need some small upgrade for your category. So like a filtered uh, derived category or train or whatever upgrades, like DG or infinity. You're trying one, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> um, can I so ask, so, um... Well, there are other uh, uh, standard facts like Frobenius semi-simplicity, like Frobenius acts semi-simply on uh, stocks of the sheaves in the corresponding category. And yes. uh, this, I guess this can be proved kind of a posteriori, but does this uh, theory of uh, materic sheaves give it sort of for free yes. or? Yes, yes, because you have the realization functor. I mean, basically, you have a functor which goes from the motives to the elladic sheaves. Uh -huh. um, so, and then everything decomposes nicely. So, when you restrict to any stratum, 
uh, you will just have you can have like a direct sum of the vector spaces. Mm -hmm. And this then corresponds to that you just have the nice snow uh, extensions between the different Tate objects. Which so you can set up your monoidal category in this mixed sheaves, and then you yes. have yes. And also, I mean, it shows that everything is independent of L if you are into this question, because the sheaves already work rationally. I mean, also, you can basically do stuff already integrally, but then it's more difficult because then there will be extensions between the uh, Tate objects. So it's not so nice. So for this talk, everything is rational. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start part two, then, if you're ready. OK, great. So remember, in part one, five minutes ago, uh, we discussed the Cauchy duality and how you can make it into a statement about graded category O and this graded version of sheaves, which we called mixed for some reason instead of graded, OK? So now, uh, immediately after we learned about this, I mean, most people didn't learn it here, but uh, after I told you this, uh, we want to get rid of the grading. Yeah. So this is the idea of the following slide. So, OK, this is the Cauchy duality we had before. And on the left-hand side, we can get rid of the grading by just passing from graded category O to just category O. Um, and now our question is, can we kind of fill this diagram here, also get rid of the grading on the right-hand side? OK, now we have to be kind of careful, because we shouldn't get rid of the grading in just any way that comes to our mind. But it should kind of be compatible with this Cauchy duality. Yeah? So Cauchy duality exchanges the grading shift on the left-hand side with this shift uh, and twist uh, thing on the right-hand side, yeah? this diagonal thing. And the realization functor here on the left hand side forgets about this, uh, the, 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 this just this shift. So, to make this into a commutative diagram, we need some functor from our mixed sheaves into something that forgets about the shift twist functor, like this. So, for example, I mean, there's this realization functor for mixed sheaves, but this one would forget about the Tate twist and not the Tate twist plus cohomological shift like this. So to fill this diagram, we need to kind of find a category which would fit there. And now, I mean, there would be a, I think one could make a very stupid answer and just put by brute force, remove the grading. Yeah, but this is kind of against the spirit. Uh, we want to find some natural nice objects which can sit in this corner there, yeah? not just something you can just build by brute force. Okay, and the answer to this is on the next slide, where I want to introduce k-motives. So actually, when I taught, told you that uh, you have this uh, mixed uh, motives and the realization functor to sheaves, uh, this is just half of the story. There's also a realization functor to some much uh, lesser known objects, I would say, which are called uh, k-motives. And uh, K motives are also something like uh, sheaves. They have a six functor formalism and so on and so on. But uh, they are correspond to, to, to K theory. And what's very nice about this realization functor, the one on the left hand side, it forgets about the Tate twist, whereas the one on the right hand side forgets about the shift and twist, exactly what we want. Yeah. And uh, just as a slogan, because I won't actually explain how to define K motives and Actually, I won't yeah, <laughs> talk too much about the details, but just as the slogans, K motives are like sheaves, but instead of computing cohomology, they compute K theory, yeah? Algebraic K theory. So let's look at the picture. This is the picture. So the beautiful thing about the motives is that actually they, they define a cohomology theory, which is called motivic cohomology. And this cohomology theory is not just graded in one degree, but it is bi-graded. So one grading comes from the Tay twist, and the other grading comes from the cohomological shift. So um, meaning if you compute, for example, the cohomology of P1, it's not just two vector spaces, one in degree 0 and one in degree 2. It's rather two vector spaces, one in degree zero, one in degree one comma two, or two comma one, uh, or however you <laughs> around to do this, okay? But uh, then when you pass from motivic cohomology just to the usual cohomology, you kind of kill one of the dimensions because usual cohomology just is graded in one direction. So you would kind of squish this whole picture to the left in this particular example, yeah? 
But when you pass to K theory, you squish it more in this direction, yeah? Because all the interesting stuff about P1 in this case sits in degree zero, K zero of P1, yeah? Okay, so you squish everything together in this direction. That's kind of the intuition. So you can pass from motives either to, 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 to uh, sheaves, and there's just cohomology, which is one graded like this, or you can pass to K motives where you do it like this, okay? And actually, I think the story now is a little bit backwards because I think first, when, man, when one first came up with uh, uh, um, motivic cohomology, this was due to an idea due to Balenson, which is, goes the following way. You have K theory, and then this is just great, has just one grading. But then you look at the Adams eigenspaces in K-theory, which gives you a grading on K-theory, everything rational. Yeah? And this is now uh, the, the, those bi-graded groups we get now, those, this is motivic cohomology. Yeah? So kind of motivic cohomology has one additional grading uh, than the K-theory, and you can pass between them using those Adams eigenspaces. And exactly this happens also now on a categorical level. Yeah? So in the, in the home spaces in my category of K-motives are K theory, or to be precise, homotopy invariant K theory, but it doesn't matter for us. And uh, the home spaces in um, the motivic world at this motive mode uh, uh, in the category of the derived category of motives are motivic cohomology. And the functor is doing like, like the, the functor from the motives to the K motives just puts everything together like this, reassembles the motivic cohomology into the K theory. Yeah. So basically, K motives, and also if you look at certain definitions of motives, the K motives come before, then they introduce some uh, additional grading, and then they introduce motives. Yeah. So actually, K motives are like a stepping stone when building motives, but for us, they will be like an object we will be interested in now. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. So the, yes. the, uh, <clears throat> your functor will be like a a map from uh, Chao groups to uh, K theory. Is that correct? So for to DK, that's- Yes, at the yes, exactly. Uh, yes, 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 exactly, yeah. So basically this functor, this functor realizes this uh, on a categorical level, level, this vision of Balenson, which was that this is how you can construct motivic cohomology without ever really defining an abelian category of motives. And how did he do it? I mean, basically his idea was do the same thing as you would do in uh, uh, um, topological, in the topological setting. They, they would try to build cohomology, but just from the topological K theory. And he does this the motivic version there. Okay. So uh, now I want to talk to you about the amazing properties about, of K motives. So in the same way as I defined the constructible motives before, I can also define the constructible K motives. Yeah? Like this, like I can take the uh, the um, the, uh, the triangulated categories of the objects just living on the on the Schubert, sorry, living on the Bruhl sets, like this. So this category still has six functor formalism. It still has the weight structure, yeah. Well, passing from the motives to the sheaves loses the weight structure. Passing from motives to the to to K motives does not lose the weight structure. So. You can also talk about like the K Chow motives inside of your category. And it turns out that also this has a nice description in terms of like IC complexes. Um, this category of weight zero part of your K motives have this nice description as additive category generated by the IC complexes. Now you notice this shift twist is gone because it acts as the identity on our category. And this has a uh, description, but now not in terms of graded Zergel modules, but just Zergel modules. Okay, so the grading is gone for good. And the weight complex functor thing also still works. And this category of uh, constructible K motives on this flag variety is just the homotopy category of Zergel modules, but now in a completely geometric way, I would say. Okay, so now we can actually fill our picture and uh, get this diagram, yeah? So now uh, on the top, we have this classical Cauchoux duality. On the bottom, we have Cauchoux duality, which has no gradings anymore, yeah? So I think one, sh I mean, it's kind of, I don't know how to call it now because Cauchoux duality critically relies on the grading, but now it's just more about both categories, the combinatorics of both categories are the same. On the left-hand side, the projectives behave in the same way as those intersection objects on the right-hand side, okay? Which is, 
Okay, so somehow there's this slogan that under Kozhul duality, K motives should be Kozhul dual to constructible sheaves, yeah? Because alternatively, I could have also written this as an equivalence between constructible sheaves on a flag variety and constructible K motives on the Langlands dual flag variety, yeah? So somehow, if you don't want gradings and you want to do Kozhul duality, you should allow yourself to also use K motives and not just constructible sheaves, okay? Okay, so, so, so I mean, at this point, you could say, uh, whatever yeah because it doesn't help at all yeah it's just removing the gradings and this you could have done before by brute force but the next thing i want to do is kind of convince you that k motives have some potential that is uh, more than just this thing yeah because k theory has the potential to be more than just a cohomology squished together yeah okay so um let's do some more involved causal duality uh, which appeared uh, later on, yeah? So, um, I don't know when this idea first came up, but there's a paper by Braden and Lunds, which does some different kind of Kozhul duality, um, which is uh, on uh, affine toric varieties. And what they show is that there's a kind of Kozhul duality between equivariant sheaves on an affine toric variety and unipotently monodromic sheaves on the uh, dual toric variety. So what they kind of uh, kind of establish with this is that when you do kosher duality, but you actually want to do equivariant sheaves and not just sheaves, you should allow yourself to also do monodromic objects on the kosher dual side. So this was then, uh, uh, I don't know if this idea came from this paper, but Anyways, the same idea was then done uh, in very big generality for Kozhu duality of Katsumuzi groups by Vlasokopnikov and Dion. So what they show is that they are, uh, unfortunately here I needed to change the Langlands dual of your formulation, I hope you don't mind. But uh, what they uh, did, they showed that there's a Kozhu duality of, of uh, this kind of flag varieties, but now it exchanges equivariant sheaves on the one hand side, mixed equivariant sheaves on the one hand side, and unit potently monodromic sheaves uh, on the Langlands dual side, like this. Okay, so this hugely extends the closure duality before because now it also works for Katsumuri groups and not just for this our small flag varieties we had before. Okay, um, good. So, um, I mean, instead of explaining this uh, kind of whole uh, thing, which I think I can't, I just want to explain the underlying idea. So why should uh, some uh, equivariant cohomology correspond to unipotent monodromy, yeah? And for this, I want to look at underlying rings. So an underlying ring for the, for the, for the, um, for the um, equivariant side would be the torus equivariant cohomology ring of a point, or in other words, the cohomology ring of the Borel construction of my torus. So this ring acts on everything on the left-hand side, yeah? So, um, I mean, it acts even on both sides, okay. So of the left-hand side. So um, this ring is just the same as the symmetric algebra of the, of the um, uh, character lattice rationalized. Okay, you do everything rationally. So now um, let's do the following. Let's make this into the total cohomology. So let's say instead of summing over the degrees, let's take the direct product over those degrees. And then this ring is via the churn uh, character isomorphism, just the same as the K theory of the, uh, of the space, okay? So this is now the same. So here the K theory is again, just squishing together stuff, not so much more interesting. But there are actually two versions of K theory. I mean, also there are two versions of cohomology, but here there are two versions of K theory. This is the Borel equivariant K theory, but there's also the Redon equivariant K theory, which would do the following. It would not take the, K theory of the classifying space, but instead it would take the K theory of the category of representations of the torus. Yeah. And this gives you the representation ring, which is the group algebra of the character lattice of this torus. Okay. So now you have this, those rings. And actually, what happens is the Atia Siegel completion theorem tells you that the left hand side, this cohomology thing, is a completion of the right hand side, which is the K theoretic thing. Okay. So in some sense, uh, studying equivariant cohomology is like studying a completed version of uh, K equivariant K theory. Okay, so this is what this uh, should tell us. And now, um, why should there be a relation between 
uh, um, uh, equivariant and monodromic at all. This is just comes from the duality of tori. So monodromic means the fundamental group acts, yeah? And the group algebra of the fundamental group is just the same as the, equi the equivalent case theory of a point of the Langlands, uh, sorry, of the dual torus, no Langlands yet, yeah? Both are just the, the this have this explicit uh, description. So now uh, you combine this uh, TR Siegel completion and the duality of torus, and you see the equivalent cohomology on the left hand side corresponds to a completion of the fundamental group on the right hand side. So meaning on the left hand side we have this completion picture because we did equivalent cohomology, and on the right hand side we only get unipotently monodromic sheaves because we need to complete the fundamental group. So we don't want all representations of the fundamental group, but only the unipotent ones. Yeah, which corresponds to taking a completion. Okay, I don't know if this is a fair description of this picture, but maybe. But what this tells us is the idea, why not uh, get rid of all the gradings and completion in this picture and just do everything with K-theory and the fundamental group itself and not uh, do the completion. I mean, I guess I mean, there are millions of reasons of doing the completion. For example, one big reason is that this is a theorem so it's proven and there's lots of theory around it, but I know I'm just going to present a conjecture. Yeah. So the conjecture is the following. I look at, you at monodromic sheaves on my, uh, on my uh, group G, but not unipotently, all monodromic sheaves. And on the right hand side, instead of looking at the um, equivariant cohomology, I look at equivariant K motives. Uh, so instead of looking at equivariant sheaves, I look at equivariant uh, K motives instead. Yeah? And then the underlying rings of this uh, uh, story, oh, sorry, let me, yeah, the rings here, the underlying rings of those stories match up. Yeah, On the left-hand side, the fundamental group acts from the left and the right. And on the right-hand side, the equivalent cohomology of the torus, I think there's a check missing, acts also from the left and the right. Yeah, So the rings at least agree that act on everything. And now, um, this uh, duality uh, in the same way as in the Brezukovnikov Jung story should map free monodromic tilting sheaves on the left hand side to equivariant intersection K theory complexes on the right hand side. And this uh, equivalence should also have like a complete uh, Zergel description. But now the Zergel modules uh, will be Zergel bimodules because we act from both sides. And also they won't be over our ring S but rather they will be over R, the representation uh, ring of our torus. Okay, so, and I think it's not completely hopeless to have to study K-theoretic circle bimodules because in a paper from a long time ago from Matthew Dyer, they were actually already introduced, yeah? So they already exist. If you look in some very small paragraph of this paper, which thankfully he pointed out to me, so I didn't have to find it myself. Okay, so um, this is a conjectural uh, picture, which gets rid of the uh, equivalent cohomology, replaces it by equivalent K-theory, gets rid of the unipotent in front of monodromic and uh, is ungraded. And maybe it is true, yeah? So um, it's true for Tori, it's true for SL2. <laughs> and uh, above this, I am working uh, and trying to figure out if it's uh, really uh, true. So uh, let's see how much time is left. Oh. A lot of time. Okay, I'm already uh, almost finished. I mean, now I did the example computation, which is boring. And um, I want to say what kind of further direction, apart from proving a conjecture like this, can be achieved with K-motives. So similar stuff already appeared in the literature, like doing a K-theoretic version of whatever you do with uh, cohomology before. Yeah? So for example, uh, recently uh, there was someone studied intersection K-theory. And I think that K-motives are just the perfect surrounding uh, category for studying intersection K-theory, which is like a K-theoretic version of intersection uh, cohomology. Mm, yeah, so this would be a nice direction. Uh, then similar things like, for example, people already studied like a K-theoretic version of sheaves on moment graphs, which, uh, so it's related to K-motives. And uh, this paper, which I mentioned before, by Dyer, where also something like K-theoretic circle bimodules were already studied as well. And um, then uh, the big, big goal, I mean, for me maybe, is the circle conjecture for real reductive groups, because 
that's one of the conjecture that Jordi still <laughs> left behind. And uh, so uh, maybe uh, this conjecture is about kind of a crucial duality, but which works for real reductive groups. And actually, some people would say that to really prove this conjecture, maybe you need some ungraded uh, theory because it's not so completely clear. I mean, I don't know anyways, but it's not so completely clear if all of those categories that appear in this uh, for the real reductive groups really do admit a grading in a nice way. So maybe the K-motives will give a new approach uh, here to the Zerbit conjecture as well. I mean, who knows? And uh, I don't know, maybe other things I would be happy to talk to you about. And I'm already done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jens, for that interesting talk. And any questions? So uh, can I ask uh, two questions? So one is, uh, uh, so for this intersection key theory, um, is there an expectation that it can, uh, in the case of like, if you do the corresponding version of the uh, of the geometric satakia that you get, uh, you'll recover the quantum group, or it's yes. So I mean, yes, yes. I mean, I was asked uh, this question by uh, uh, Chemnitzer. Uh, sorry, what was his first name? So, anyways, he asked me this question, and uh, maybe he expects that it works because he he kind of uh, produces a category like this, but kind of more in a combinatorial fashion. Yeah, maybe but, not in general, but in type A or something. Yes, 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 exactly. So I guess, yes, the answer is yes, this should be the case. But I have to say the following. So just technology wise, how far are K motives? The thing is, so far K motives only work when you have a linearly reductive group. So if you equivariant K motives, sorry, only work if you have a linearly reductive group. So now I always have to do everything in characteristic P. So, uh, to, to, so the higher K groups vanish rationally of a point. So then in characteristic P, I can only do torus equivariant stuff, unfortunately, yeah? So I can't do it. And also I will never be able to construct the equivariant K motives because very difficult business. And this is actually due to Mark Hoywa, who does nothing else than work with motives. And he was barely able to figure it out. So unfortunately, I think the technology is not there yet. So I can only do tori. And here I just cheated, yeah? I just said, you take B cross B equivariant K motives. Really, you take sheaves which are locally constant and then T cross T equivariant. So this works, yeah, unfortunately. But I would love to do it, yeah. <laughs> OK. Is there... Another yeah. question about this last thing that you said about the real groups. Mm. Um, so in the quite discrete case, uh, the, I have this paper with Kari. Yes. Villain and um, where I believe we get, you know, we do more or less the analog of Zorgis first paper, yes. or BGS paper. Well, if, if one side is uh, uh, quite a split, but yes. um, so um, then the pro, but there still remains a problem of upgrading it to this um, Mativic world. Right. Mm. Yes, yes, uh, yes. But yeah, so I think there was a problem actually for me when I tried to say, okay, how should those unipotently monodromic sheaf world work in the motivic world? Because like having this action of fundamental group and so on, it's difficult. So for elastic sheaves, I guess you can somehow do it. But then um, I don't really know how to do it for the motives. And uh, okay. so. So I don't know. I mean, it's probably possible, but I can't do it. But so the hope would be to just forget about the, this uh, whole uh, grading after all and just do it on the constructible sheaves, which is possible through your work, uh, basically. Yeah. By the way, I mean, I don't know how exciting this is to people, but uh, as we point out at the end of this paper, with the running kind of to, 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 to treat the general case, we need this monodromic completions and everything, but there are some new examples beyond like the uh, category or where we have a nice kind of, where both sides can be, uh, appear as finite dimensional algebra. For example, you can start with a split group. 
I see, I see. So, yeah, I guess this would be the starting point to get to, to the Zerg conjecture. Look, if your paper is a nice k motivic interpretation. Yeah, so, 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 I guess you're not lucky. So what is kind of good about this thing? So I said, I mean, in this picture with the sheaves or the unipotently monodromic uh, thing on the representation theoretic side, it would kind of correspond to fixing a central character. So maybe, so the crucial duality side would be just to not fix a central character and maybe do all of them at the same time. So that's kind of the, the would happen in this k-motivic side if you want to compare to the representation theory as well. Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I guess this is another question on how well the K-theory K-motive stuff has developed, but the, the structure sets, the Ziggel structure sets. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you said that everything should be done in terms of the K-theoretic Ziggel bimodules. Uh, is that structure sets actually in place though? Uh, yes, I can prove it. Uh, but the, the thing is, uh, I mean, basically, yeah, how do you prove it? Uh, so, I, I mean, th there's this paper on the, um, I mean, Somehow what suffices to always prove this is to have like an weakly equivariant objects. And since all the strongly equivariant objects here are also weakly equivariant, so meaning you have this, uh, this uh, isomorphism between pullback along the action map and the projection, uh, th this already, this also holds here. Yeah? So you can use the same argument because from then this point on, it's just a six functor formalism that plays. Okay. The yes, so this, would be possible. So sorry, the, yeah, yeah, this would be possible. So the difficulties, there are lots of difficulties. So for example, there's this paper by Brezukovnikov Riesch, which does the Zergel theory uh, for uh, for flag varieties directly without any of the, um, but I mean, not Zergel theory in the sense that you look at the intersection complexes, but rather you really look at the uh, tilting, perverse tilting sheaves and want to build a theory for this. So my big difficulty is completely understanding everything they did and also based uh, this Brezukovnikov Yun paper it is based on, but then try to do it not with the unipotently monodromic side, but with all of them. And the thing is, there are many technical things with this unipotently monodromic category, the way that you can import basically everything from the uh, non-unipotent stuff, I mean, using this kind of ideas on the completion of a T-structure and so on, to, to make this work just in general difficult, yeah? So I'm trying to figure it out, but it's difficult to, to do it, yeah. So, so what you're telling me is that the, the diagonal equivalence on the right-hand side is fine and the diagonal equivalence on the left-hand side is very tricky. Yeah, for me, yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Yeah. On the right hand side, it's more the difficulties the following. I mean, you have to extract the correct things from this motivic literature because they would never come down to your level and say, this is the category of K motives because uh, that's not what they do. Yeah? They say, okay, there's the spectrum KGL, which lives in some infinity category. So the rest do it how you want. And you send them lots of emails and no answer and so on. <laughs> So that's the difficulty at this side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one comment, and oh, sorry, one comment and one question. Um, so I remember reading that little bit in Dyer a long time ago, and I remember thinking, I don't see where these um, kind of K theory Zogel biomodules, like why they should have an existence in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and somehow the first time that I became convinced that they have a mathematical existence in nature is talking to Roman when he explained to me this, um, like this um, monodromy at the identity, like the monodromy of vanishing cycles at the identity. So this gives you a natural um, space with an action of the um, group algebra of the Lie algebra, the, sorry, the group algebra of the torus um, by a monodromy. And you can see um, rather easily that it has the right size. And then I thought, oh, okay, Dyer wasn't crazy after all. These um, <laughs> these these K theory Zergel modules have an existence. Um, the other question that I'm kind of fascinated by is somehow like th throughout your talk, you're using the entire time that this is kind of the one place in the mathematical universe where we where k, where higher k groups are easy. Mm. 
Um, and I was just wondering, do you see any kind of um, like re representation theoretic significance for you know non-zero higher k groups? For example, if I was to do this over um, even over q or something. Um, yeah, no. the, yeah, unfortunately not. I mean, there was some, I mean, there's this work by uh, Timo Richards and Jakob Schwolbach, which do kind of motivic uh, version of the Satake. And they also do something when the, the kind of, you have kind of extensions between the tail motives. And in this picture, they can show that kind of this group you would get from there, like the, the like a part of the motivic Galois group would just split off everything. So in this setting, it doesn't have any significance except for just being there. So I guess the same would be also true for the higher K theory here. I think if there would be higher K theory, it maybe would kind of split off. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, no, I have no idea. Yeah. So you're kind of saying that it would just always be a product situation and so so actually, I'm not saying this myself because I, when I asked Zorgel, he told me that Balenson told him that this is the case. So I mean, this is, no, I don't know. But in their paper, actually, they really show that you can split off this group. So I don't know, maybe it is kind of orthogonal after all. Yeah. yeah. And also, it would make lots of the stuff much harder. For example, this that the weight complex functor is an equivalence would not be true anymore because the, they would then appear as X groups, which kind of do not appear in this. Uh, yeah. But maybe you can split them off somehow. Yeah, but sorry, I don't know what good answer. I guess just one more like comment. There's the this student Valentin uh, of um, Simon who has studied, um, also I guess there's a paper of Xiwe and Lustig um, where they study various um, monodromic versions of this. And you know you could dream that you have this equivalence and then you complete it different um, characters and then yes. all of these, these other ones yes, yes. pop out of it. Yes, I think that's the, that would be beautiful, yes. Because I would also think, I mean, if you, for example, look at Zirgel's conjecture for real reductive groups, yeah, they have already enough parameters around, so it would be beautiful to get rid of the uh, the central character, for example, which would be exactly this uh, thing here. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So exactly. So ex 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 there are different versions of this completion theorem. So instead of looking at K theory equivariant K theory, we can look at twisted equivariant K theory or twisted equivariant sheaves. Then you just to, um, complete at a different idea in this picture, and the same is for the monodromy. If you have a certain impose a certain uh, that it should act via a certain generalized character. Yes, exactly, which don't appear in this uncompleted picture. Yes. So, so, so I think for such ideas, you know, there's a good testing ground is just the group GL1, right? Yes. So there is no, I mean, if you work and well, first, uh, yeah, many questions become trivial, but if you want to, uh, Do some duality then uh, mm. just, yes. just, I, I don't think there is a like a relation between say constructible shifts on gl1 and gl1 there's duality i don't think there's any duality like like a direct duality there are, there are factor. factors which you know mm. at first they look different and have different properties in different contexts i mean mm. at parallelic shifts there is something like Gabriel uh, there for D modules, there is a very clear picture like uh, connecting D modules on C star to um, A1 equivariant quasi coherent sheaves, uh, Z equivariant quasi coherent sheaves on A1. Mm -hmm. it's, but it's all there. But I mean, I don't know in this uh, about this motivic world, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> if there is something, then I think it should be tested. Yes, yes, yes. So I mean, so the, I mean, just this conjecture here. I mean, for Torre it works, but maybe you mean something, just, just. Uh, but it just works by just combinatorially describing it because both categories. If you just have a tor, if G is a torus, everything else is also the same torus, then you the 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 it will just all becomes modules over R or derived category of modules over this R. 
because on the left hand side you can look at this free monodromic sheaf on T and the endomorphism ring there of this R. And on the right hand side, you will have the constant object and the endomorphism ring there of the B. Uh, and also the representations of rings. So you have this matchup. And for SL2, basically what I do to try it for SL2 is like look at how you do it and then copy it. <laughs> and it still, uh, it still works. This kind of process of building this uh, big tilting object. I mean, for SL2, it's very direct because you just write down one X which you directly get from uh, this uh, localization triangle. And then you can compute that the endomorphism ring is like R tensor R over R W. <laughs> That's what it should be. And then the rest uh, follows from this. Yeah. But already for SL3, it's difficult because um, you have to have this property that if you push forward and then pull back to another stratum, uh, that you still keep all the finiteness conditions. So that still the action, the, the fundamental, the, if you restrict to the stalks, that they will be finitely generated under the fundamental group, which is, I guess, can be difficult. So I'm trying to directly prove this by uh, using direct uh, description of this home space in, in geometric terms, which is involved there. But uh, yeah, so that's my approach. But yeah, okay, just to clarify. So this works for Tori, but there is no photo, there is no version with that would not involve fixing monodromy, even for Tori, right? Uh, no, you don't need to fix the monodromy for Tori right. because so I mean let's let's I, I did this example computation here. So let's say you take T okay. cross T mono. Okay, <laughs> so I define the T monodromic uh, sheaves just as being monodromic in this case with respect to the, uh, just to be equivariant sheaves with respect to the Lie algebra. So the Lie algebra also acts via the exponential map. So I just take equivariant uh, sheaves with respect to this. And then uh, using quotient equivalence, it's just the same as pi one of T equivariant sheaves of a point. And then this is how it would work, yeah. So the, this, this, the monodromy is not, uh, but then, but still you have to be careful, not about the characters, but the finiteness conditions. This is maybe the biggest problem for me right now. That by doing the six functors, you don't suddenly, I mean, I, I probably it will never happen, but don't suddenly get stocks which are not finitely generated over the fundamental group anymore. I mean, I guess, how should this ever happen? But it's not proven, so I don't know. One more question. Um, so Ben and I have had a lot of fun recently calculating with these um, kind of doing calculations in K-theory with Zogel biomodules and things like this. Ah. And one thing that consistently shows up is the kind of subtlety of choice of orientations in K-theory. Uh -huh. Okay, I see. Um, like, as far as I understand the kind of orientation in K-theory for P1, that like, over in, in cohomology, there's just, you know, it's a plus or minus one choice. Whereas on P1, you basically choose a, a line bundle. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, and somehow there's a hell of a lot more choices. And, um, you know, for certain equivalences, there's actually a, a, a choice that works and a whole lot that don't. Uh -huh. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was just wondering if you'd encountered the, this, these difficulties of orientations. No, no, not at all, no, no, yeah. Actually, no, I'd, I would be uh, interested to see this. <laughs> yeah, no, I do not. Yeah, so uh, like technically, where do you see the orientation in which kind of formulas does it really show up? Is it? Like a very simple, um, like basically where this is showing up the whole time is that we um, like, you know, as I learned from kind of Ben and Kovanov, um, basically um, the heart of Zergel biomodules is some kind of Frobenius extensions of rings. Um, like the simple example is that, you know, RS, the S invariance inside R sitting inside R is some kind of Frobenius extension. Mm -hmm. And then you can imagine a big cube of Frobenius extensions corresponding to all your, your subsets of simple reflections. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of, induction and restriction along this big cube essentially gives you the theory of Zogel biomodules. Mm -hmm. 
And so now you can replace this um, big cube with um, just with K theory and like the corresponding K theory groups. Um, but now when you push and pull, so if you think about like what's the Frobenius structure, it's essentially an orientation. It's like um, being able to push forward to a point. Yes, yes, I see. Um, and so you need to consistently choose um, like, you know, you, you might say, oh, we just take a demo, like, you know, there's a demo zero operator. That's what we used earlier. That was the kind of algebraic incarnation of pushing forward to a point. Um, so what we can do here is just the K-theory demo zero operator. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but now you have this, this decision of like, do you twist by, like normally in, when you define the, the, the K-theory demo zero operator, you use a row, you put a row in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out that you, there's a whole lot more that you can chuck in that in that formula um, and it should, and it actually turns out that in certain co computations that we've been doing to do with geometric Shitake, like the, 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 the naive choice doesn't actually work. Oh, okay, I see. I hope this won't happen to me. <laughs> I, I wouldn't okay, go so far as to say the naive choice won't work. Like we're using the naive choice for the demo zero operators but it's not the naive choice for what corresponds to the adjunction structure and representation theory. So the adjunction, so like, you know, and for SL2, V is self-dual. And so there's certain cups and caps in the tumble weave algebra. And, and you'd expect the, the corresponding theoretic circle by modules are, are also dual to each other, um, but we have to use a different duality structure than the standard one induced by the standard Frobenius extension. I would still I would still say we use the same Frobenius extensions, but we use different adjunctions for other objects. I don't know. Okay, okay. I yeah, think so I convinced myself that it's still orientations though, that it's- It's, it's still not, oriented in somewhere, just maybe like not- still like, yeah. Yes, okay. I mean, can I quickly, George, you said something about this, uh, vanishing cycles or something like this. I didn't really understand what you were saying. I just want to, where you said that you first, ah. where you first encountered this because I did not follow you. <laughs> oh, so this is just, this is um, like a picture that I learned from Roman. So maybe um, he can <laughs> provide a better explanation. I can try it, try. Um, so there's this functor that we know from the micro local seminar of, of, micro localizing a perverse sheaf. Um, but in the specific case of the, it's kind of easy on the, so it, on the flag variety, a very interesting point to do this is at the co-normal bundle to the base point. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that, so we take, you know, T E star, and then we delete from this all of the, um, all of the closures of the um, co-normal bundles that come from um, simple reflections. And so this gives us, um, so now we have an abelian fundamental group. And in this particular case, microlocalization gives us a functor from category O to um, represent, represent, like representations of this fundamental group, which is canonically the, um, by one of the co-characters co of the torus. Functions on the dual torus, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, in this case, you know, we, we literally start with category one, and these things will be unipotent, and then we can take logs, and then we get the usual, we just get a new, another description of the usual Zorgius function. So you get an extra yeah, phenomenal algebra, and it factors through Invariants, and then this is the just another description of the usual functor, but you know it's more natural not to take the logs, and then because that's uh, what you're demanded somehow topologically, you naturally get that. Ah, okay, that interesting. Rather than the polynomial rings. Ah, okay, so the micro localization is like the functor of V, but on this uh, exactly. Okay. <laughs> And just, I don't know, it's, I found it really striking that like it's very artificial. It, it's, I mean, not very artificial, but it's somewhat artificial to take logs exactly what, as Roman is saying. Like, mm -hmm. like in this point of view, the, the K-theory Zergel mo module shows up as the really natural object. 
I see, yes, yes, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I learned more than you wrote it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I like could, could there be a theory here where, where you do not rationalize? So like everywhere you, you sort of rationalize when you do this completion theorem and things like that, but but I mean mm. um so yes for the mix sheaves uh, there's a motivic version where you would uh, where you do it mod p i can do it mod p just for the uh, mixed motives because but still there are user coincidence namely that the uh, higher k groups of fp modulo fp they vanish so uh, the, using this coincidence you can basically also build uh, mixed sheaves which have all of those nice properties with mod p coefficients but what I can't do is do rational coefficients because no matter how you do it, and I tried a lot, is you will have those extensions around and maybe you could deal with them. So non-trivial extensions between the Tate objects, but I don't know how to deal with them really. I'm also not sure if the six functor formalism, I mean, there's some paper by Spitzweg, which claims to have this kind of six functor formalism with integral coefficients already uh, working but um, it's extremely difficult and basically gluing together all the different categories for all the different coefficients. It's very uh, strange kind of construction. So maybe you could use this, but then you have to deal with the extensions of the Tate objects, which I don't know really how to do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions for Jens? Okay, if not, let's take him again. Thanks so much.